Hi, everybody. My name is Kirby Croxted. I am a PhD student with Dr. Barry Bradford, and today I'm going to talk to everyone about um, feeding sweet brand to lactating dairy cattle and how we used a meta-regression approach to view that. So whenever I'm talking about feeding byproducts or co-products, I really like to look at the whole industry's sustainability. Uh, beginning with this figure here on the right from White and Hall in 2017, it's a great illustration of how integrated all of these industries are. They all come together and provide each other with products and services. So really, one of the things I find most impressive about that, though, is that livestock upcycle 43 million tons of these products annually. That's even more impressive when we consider the data that we have looking at human edible conversions. When we look at human edible energy conversion, we increase that threefold if we feed byproducts or co-products. In a separate study looking at human edible uh, energy and protein, protein was increased tenfold when we included, included byproducts or waste products. That increase is even more profound if we look at digestible amino acids. So the bottom line is these improve our sustainability and they increase the ruminant's contribution to um, the human food supply. So I think they're an excellent tool to use when feeding dairy cattle. The other context that I like to lay out for people when talking about these fibrous byproducts is climate change and how climate change is gonna have an impact on our crop yields and forage yields and feed supplies. So climate change may increase the yields of certain crops in certain geographies, but in extreme weather events are also more likely and that can challenge some of those gains. So certain parts of the United States, especially the northern latitudes, will have the possibility to harvest more biomass per acre if they have adequate moisture because of the longer growing season, whether that is, you know, letting crops grow longer to increase their biomass or having um, cover crops to bookend your main crop, whatever the case may be, there's opportunity. But the increase of severe weather events I mentioned are also going to threaten those yields. And in this figure on the right, which is a picture of the occurrence of drought conditions um, according to soil moisture, you'll see that here in the United States, especially here in the Great Lakes, we're going to see a dramatic increase in the occurrence of drought-like soil moisture conditions. So we need to understand that climate change is going to affect our forage supplies, our feed supplies, and the consistency of them. A perfect example is Nebraska, Iowa, and South Dakota just a couple of years ago. Floods swept through that part of the region, and you had issues with getting um, adequate hay, forage, or even corn grain when they were swept away by these dramatic floods. Events like that are going to keep occurring. So as cattle nutritionists and dairy nutritionists, we have to continue being flexible and creative. And those are the two words I really want to focus on, flexible and creative when balancing our diets. Looking at sweet bran in particular, I'm gonna cruise through these materials and methods briskly um, so we can spend a little more time on our results. But just to walk you through what we did, we did a literature search in two databases, Scopus and PubMed. And we also used Cargill's internal research library, which really el eliminates some of the publication bias you can face in meta-analyses. Um, but for these studies to be included in our analysis, they had to have fed sweet bran, which I um, have as SB here on the slide, and I will refer to it that way throughout the presentation. Uh, two or more concentrations were fed. They also need to report the means and the standard errors of dry matter intake, milk, and component production. And finally, we also wanted the nutrient and ingredient composition of those treatments fed so we can look at the effects of different starch or different forage levels or a certain um, forage NDF levels have an effect on sweet bran uh, inclusion. Then finally, we looked at, or we collected the dry matter intake and milk production. If they had the ruminal measurements, that was really a bonus. We um, evaluate that at the end, but um, we had a small number of comparisons, so I don't draw hard and fast conclusions from that. We also have the diet nutrients, as I mentioned above, and then body weight and days of milk. All of this led to 12 studies used in our analysis. The full linear mixed model included covariates for days and milk, body weight, dry matter, crude protein, NDF, forage NDF, and starch, as well as sweet bran. The linear by linear interaction for each of those covariates with sweet bran was also included, along with quadratic terms for each one in what I call our full model. Then, uh, study, I should note that study was also included as a random effect in each model. And finally, the way we chose our final model was a procedure called a, called a backward stepwise elimination procedure, which basically we start with that full model, we look at the ANOVA and p-value results, we eliminate the highest p-value, kick it out. Run it again, kick out the next highest p-value, and we do that until each term is significant, and in this case, we used a cutoff of 0.05. I also want to note that we um, respected the model hierarchy, and what that means, uh, for those that might be less familiar with the statistical jargon, is that if uh, dry matter 
if the linear dry matter term was insignificant, but it was included in say dry matter squared or dry matter by sweet bran, then the linear term was also included in the model. So if it was included in a higher order term, we kept it in the model and our models were screened for collinearity, residuals, normality of the residuals and influential observations before we accepted them as our final model. Um, I do want to acknowledge a past meta-analysis that was done that had a similar objective. Um, Dirac B et al looked at corn gluten feed, but they looked at wet, dry, sweet bran and commodity wet corn gluten feed. So really um, they're com drawing comparisons a lot across a wide range of products, which we don't feel like is completely sound. And one of the ways to illustrate that is that the sweet bran nutrient concentrations are shown in this column here. The wet corn gluten feed commodity concentrations are shown in this far column to the right, as reported in the 2016 beef cattle NASM. What you'll see is that sweet bran is greater in dry matter, greater in crude protein, but lower in starch. So these products are not necessarily equivalents. So we really wanted to break that out, look at one specific product. And finally, dry matter differences alone have led to performance changes. Uh, wet versus dry distiller's grains is a perfect example of that. So just to start to caution you to the results we're gonna go over is sweet bran was correlated with NDF, starch and forage concentration. And I show those here, 0 0.5, 0 0.68, 0 0.64, and negative 0.58 when we're talking about forage NDF. And I mean, that's to be expected. There's only so much room in a ration, you know, if we're feeding this much sweet bran, we gotta take that much of something else out. Um, so that is going to complicate some of the conclusions we draw. So I really want everyone to think critically when we're walking through these results for yourself and realize so many things are changing when we're talking about just a sweet bran response. Um, so just be cautious and thoughtful. And also uh, we did use the best practices to minimize collinearity problems in the final model uh, presented. So just to start, um, sweet bran interacted with NDF to affect dry matter intake. And that is shown in this panel A on the left. We have NDF on the X, dry matter intake on the Y. Um, and for all the graphs that show multiple sweet bran concentrations, it'll be shown in the same colors with 0% pink, 20% green, 40% blue. So in this dry matter intake plot, we'll see that 40% and uh, sweet bran increased our dry matter intake, but that that advantage over the lower concentrations was reduced as NDF increased. So we do increase intake. It appears we increase intake with sweet bran, but we need to be cautious about total diet NDF as well. When we look at milk yield, we saw another response. This is one of those places I wanna encourage you to be cautious, is we don't have the complete response surface for starch and sweet bran to look at this interaction really well. Um, but what it tells us is, or what this plot portrays is that at a high sweet bran concentration, we need more starch to increase milk yield. And what I take from that isn't so much we need to feed starch and sweet bran, it's that if we're feeding a lot of sweet bran, we're probably feeding a lot of fiber. If we're feeding a lot of fiber, we might be limiting microbial crude protein production or limiting propionate and limiting lactose production downstream. So we just wanna make sure we got enough room and fermentation going on when we're feeding sweet bran. But what I mean by the response surface is that this is a plot of sweet bran on the X, starch concentration on the Y, and you'll see they're correlated as I mentioned before, but we have these gaps where we don't have data points to fill those to look at this response across that whole response surface. So I would just encourage everyone to be thoughtful looking at these results. Um, sweet bran was associated with milk fat production. Um, in particular, we look at fat percent in this first panel by forage NDF. And basically, when we're feeding high amounts of sweet bran, increasing forage NDF with high sweet bran concentrations has a positive effect on milk fat percent. Really, that tells me we need adequate effective fiber when we're feeding cows with non-forage fiber sources. To look at fat yield on the right, we can see that sweet bran had a quadratic response. So we see that optimized at about 26% dry matter for sweet bran. Um, there is a wide confidence band around that. So you can see excellent fat yields with up to 40% sweet bran. But when you get beyond that, you're gonna look at likelihood of decreasing your milk fat yield response. When we look at milk protein, we see some interactions occurring once again. Both of these panels show our milk protein yield on the Y with forage NDF on the X in this first case. And what we see in this interaction with forage NDF and sweet bran is that for high levels of sweet bran, increasing forage NDF has a greater negative association with milk protein yield. So the last slide I said, we need to make sure we have enough forage NDF for milk fat, but too much forage NDF brings down our milk protein. So we need to find that hot spot in the middle 
Um, and from these results, I would tell you to aim for 17 to 20%. And then also we have sweet brand yield or uh, milk protein yield with sweet brand was a quadratic response being optimized at 11%. But again, a wide confidence band so we can see adequate milk protein yield up to 25 or 30% sweet brand inclusion. Um, Sweet bran did have an effect on ruminal butyrate concentration, as you can see here with sweet bran on the X and ruminal butyrate on the Y. Across studies, there's a slight increase in ruminal butyrate as we increase sweet bran. Um, effects in other VFAs were not significant, but they did appear to be associated with the substitution strategy. So replacing forage with sweet bran led to an increase in propionate and replacing concentrate with sweet bran led to an increase in acetate. Um, we didn't have enough comparisons to really draw some hard conclusions I'd feel confident in presenting, but we did see this slight increase in butyrate that may be interesting considering the immunometabolism um, and metabolic effects of butyrate. So really what I take away from this, we do appear to increase dry matter intake, but we got to watch our total diet NDF when feeding sweet bran. We have interactions of forage NDF and sweet bran. We got to find that sweet spot where we're allowing for excellent milk fat and milk protein production. Milk fat yield and milk protein were optimized at 26 and 11% respectively. And we had an association for a slight increase in ruminal butyrate production when feeding sweet bran. So our bottom line, I would say we're gonna increase dry matter intake, but don't feed too much NDF, keep it under 34. Find that optimal forage NDF in that 17 to 20 window. And we still need to have fermentability. You gotta have starch. I didn't show this, but milk fat optimization was optimized at 26% dietary starch. Um, so that wraps up my presentation. I want to thank Dr. Schulte's, Dr. Schulte, Bradford, and Templeman for helping me go through this experiment. Um, I have my email on this final slide, and I really look forward to any interactions, and I'm looking forward to a great virtual meeting. So thank you, everybody.